Welcome to The Truth in This Art. Um, I'm your host, Rob Lee. And today, my next guest is painter, teacher, artist in residence at Motorhouse. Please welcome Ernest Shaw Jr. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, brother. I appreciate being here. Yeah, totally. Um, so you're, you're, you're a hard person to get a hand on, man. <laughs> you're a hard person to connect <laughs> with. I'll say that much. But I'm glad we were able to do that. I feel really fortunate. Um, so I want to start off for those who are undipped. Can you tell the listeners um, who you are and a bit about your work um, so we can uh, kind of get that that there, those vital stats? Sure, absolutely. Uh, Ernest Shaw, artist, educator, educator of 20 years, Baltimore City Public Schools, 15 years adjunct between Coppin State University, Baltimore City Community College, uh, Maryland Institute College of Art, and Towson, uh, Towson State University. Um, but yeah, born and raised West Baltimore. First seven years, uh, division in Lafayette. Uh, then we move up to, to we moved up to uh, Edmondson Village in 1977. Yeah. Uh, pro- product of Baltimore City Public Schools, Baltimore School for the Arts. Graduated from Morgan and and Howard. You know. Yeah. That's basically it. Uh huh. Co-parented two children. <laughs> Yeah, we we, we have some overlap there. We have a few overlap things there. I mean, Baltimore, Baltimore, Baltimore knows Baltimore. So, mm-hmm. in, in your work, um, you know, and again, this is this is for 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 the listeners. What are the themes that you find yourself like pursuing, and themes that you kind of re- return to when you're in your work? So, the overwhelming majority of my work is of people who can be defined as black. And I, I say it that way because they don't necessarily have to be from the United States. Mm-hmm. They could be from anywhere in the diaspora and or continental Africa. But, uh, um, and that's largely because of the first artwork I was exposed to was portraits uh, painted by Kaki McQueen, uh, a neighbor and, and a known artist up and down the East Coast, especially in Baltimore, Baltimore and Florida, Maryland, uh, Baltimore, Maryland and Florida to be specific. But uh, he, he painted and drew images of black folks. Yeah. And my parents exhibited that on their walls in their two-bedroom apartment. So growing up, seeing that, aesthetically seeing that, um, has had a, a, a tremendous impact on, on my imagery. Yeah. You know, so. So. I've read that one of the most prevalent aspects of your work is the, your understanding of color and figure. Tell me about color. I mean, because it's one of those things that everyone uses color the same way. It's like, you don't. <laughs> so, uh, so so, tell me about that. And for you, does color, what does color represent within your work? Um, and what are some of the most common uh, yeah. colors in your palette? A couple of things. Well, one, blue. Blue is very common, especially more recently in, in, in the murals I've painted. And that's largely influenced by um, being a member of a fraternity, you know, uh, Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. So, and, and their colors are royal blue and, and white uh, and pure white. So there's that. But then, and, you know, it's an interesting question because when I was much younger, I was intimidated by color mm-hmm. and I just drew. But I had an uncle. Dr. Luke Shaw, who's also a member of Five Acre Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, but he uh, was also a college professor. He had his doctorate in art, and he was a college professor at Cobb State University. But he was well known. So when I ended up at Morgan, uh, he would come visit my professors, and he was my great uncle. So he really he played a, a grandfather like role, and he would critique very harshly my work. And he told my professors that to push me, uh, especially my painting professor, Guy Jones, he told Professor Jones to push me relative to color because I was intimidated by color. The overwhelming majority of my work was monochromatic. So it was at that point at Morgan that I began to deal with uh, some of my insecurities relative relative to the the use of color. Um, I'll add this tidbit. Anyone who knows my work and knows me personally knows uh, I mentioned that I co-parented two children Uh, my son transitioned due to complications relative to cancer in 2008 
at eight years old. It was that event. If you look at my work prior to 2008, and you look at my work after 2008, there's a clear, um, a clear distinction relative to my use of color. My my color use of color became much more bold. Uh, I did a lot more. I was a lot more, um, or let's say, I experimented a lot more with color. Uh, I was a lot freer, mm. uh, and that's large. See, because through that traumatic experience, I became much more sensitive to color, much more, you know, the grass became greener. The sky um, was a, a rich blue, you know, much richer than prior to my son's transition. Uh, and, and this, uh, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So due to that sensitivity, being vulnerable, having gone through that, yeah. uh, it opened my spirit up to uh, really see the world different. And I think that had a, a an effect on on my use of color. Thank thank you for sharing that. And, um, said so had other piece of uh, it, it reminds me of this piece that I wrote um, about turning the um, ordinary to the extraordinary, and it was just kind of basically about being mindful and kind of seeing mm-hmm. things. And it's like all of these things that we kind of take for granted, and when you see it in a different light and different perspective, it's like, oh wow, that's what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Wow, I'm seeing clouds for the first time. Wow, the moon is so bright, and you can often mm-hmm. just miss those and ignore them but it's like that is a wonder that is a feat right there that we just ignore Mm -hmm. so you know i gotta ask this one as a as a fellow baltimore native and a morgan alum i gotta ask uh what are your strongest memories growing up in baltimore and about your time at morgan like it can be related to your work and just be like look man we used to go to a lot of parties used to get busy what was the you know what was those experiences like growing up here well I had a very rich, uh, you know, I was born in 69, late 60s. So the 70s was was bustling. I mean, you know, you in the, the, the heart of the Black Power movement. And we would, we lived right off Pennsylvania Avenue. There was a Black Panther lived on our floor in our apartment building. You know, I mean, just Blackness was very rich and bustling. You know, rep, you know, during the 70s. And then the, the 80s came and then hip hop hit, yeah. you know. Uh, so I, mean, I have, I've had a, very, I had a very rich um, first part of my life. Yeah. Uh, you know, in Baltimore, being strategically placed between the north and the south, technically it's below the Mason Dixon line, but it's really right. You know, you know, it's it's a it's a southern town with a northern facade. Yeah. You know, so we got a little bit of everything. Uh, we got some southern stuff going on, and we got you know a little northern flavor as well. As far as my experience at Morgan, it's interesting. I didn't start out at Morgan. I started out at University of Maryland College Park. That's even where I pledged, the, I pledged that fraternity. Uh, once I left Maryland, I didn't graduate from Maryland, right? I, all that fun you talk about having, I had it at Maryland. So by the time I got to Morgan and my parents said, hey, you got to pay for this, right? We're not paying for you to play around anymore, right. any longer. And I knew about the bridge. You know, I knew about that uh, the legacy of, yeah. of Morgan, so to speak, not just this engineering program. So uh, I didn't do much partying at Morgan. Yeah. I didn't hang out on the bridge at all. I knew it was time for business. Uh, I, I was working swing shift uh, 40 plus hours a week at Bethlehem Steel wow. to help pay for that education. Yeah. Yeah. So it took me a while. I had a few semesters where I had a below uh, a point zero grade point average, and I had several several semesters where I had uh, 4.0s, 3.75 grade, you know, grade point averages as well. So it was up and down for a while, but Bethlehem still helped help, uh, pay for um, that education. And, and in my experience at Morgan, Morgan saved my life, yeah. you know, especially from an, from an academic and artistic standpoint, because the love you get and the chair, the the nurturing you get from your professors at the HBCU, uh, you know, I, I do not have the words really to share how how uh, appreciative I and grateful I am to have developed the relationships I had with with my professors. You know, Angela Franklin, Guy Jones. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, it's it's a let me just say it's a long list. Yeah. Um, you know, Mr. McGuire, uh, it's, it's just so many um, 
Ali Sehat, uh, photography professor uh, whose name escapes me. I don't know why he was such a cool guy. I think he was a capper too. <laughs> but anyway, it's just super smooth. Um, but it, it'll come to me in a minute. I'm getting a little older now. But yeah, so uh, and not not just art professors. There were other yeah. prof- history professors, um, philosophy professors that that had a a real impact speech because you had to pass that speech proficiency <laughs> exam. You had to pass that writing proficiency exam to get out of the, uh, out of Morgan. That wasn't always a, a easy, you know. A easy task but you know yeah um I, I i was there like uh what is it i was a f- freshman in 03 and it's kind of like mm. everything i i wrote this in this 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 piece recently when people were asking me about like you know being here being connected to baltimore i was like everything that i got where i'm at now i every bad thing that happened to me and every great thing that's happened to me has happened in baltimore and i attribute a lot of the lessons that i've learned and being where i'm at now i was a business major I didn't do anything creative there and mm-hmm. but learning the, the, the background of foundational stuff um, that kind of has enabled me to be able to juggle all of these different things and navigate and have be able to talk <laughs> you know you gotta you gotta mm-hmm. get up and speak in those classes and i was on scholarship so it's not like and i had a mm-hmm. job so i worked for the orioles as well so i was like i don't know how i'm gonna do all this man i gotta maintain this 3.0 i want to be broke and uh you know, it was a thing. And one of my biggest and coolest professors I had was in a program I wasn't in. So definitely relating to um, that, that love that you're getting from professors that aren't necessarily even in your discipline, like, you know, business school, that was one vibe, that was one energy that was about business. But, you know, getting it from the, I guess, uh, what is it like, I had a film class, you know, communications. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, that's helped me in doing these film things that I do, these screenings and being able to break apart a film and review a film and look at it from a technical standpoint. And that's, that's helped me in being more analytical and these things that I've applied. And I don't know, you get these life lessons that aren't always in a book when you go to an HBCU. And that's what I really took out of my time at Morgan. Um, Mm -hmm. So I want to hear about networking a little bit, Um, but networking specifically with um, other artists. How do you how do you network with other artists and what is that? What does that support look like within the the artist community here? Because mm, sometimes we don't get credit for the amount of artists that and creative that we have here in Baltimore. And I want to learn a little bit more about that, like kind of network here. So uh, it's a little easier now. Mm-hmm. Because of social media, right? Um, it's, it's slightly different than it was, you know, when I came out of Morgan, uh, or even before. You know, I was at Morgan for a while. Um, I'll say this: what I find relative to Baltimore artists is that we very rarely, and I had this conversation with Condwani Fidel uh, a couple days ago. Uh, he's a writer. He's a poet very talented young man. We don't compete with one another. It's not that you don't find that competition you might find like within a group of artists in New York or maybe LA. It's, it's, we, do, we have sort of, again, Southern town with a Northern facade. Mm-hmm. That Southern aspect of it, uh, you know, it's, it's not really a competition. And and you're right, Baltimore is is really flourishing right now relative to the arts and people are beginning to notice now there were some folks who who noticed that the culture of baltimore a lot of filmmakers love to come and film here Mm -hmm. uh you know uh, because of uh the vibe of the city yeah but you talk about artists like jerrell gibbs stephen towns if they're not from baltimore they're baltimore based amy sherrill cut her teeth here for a while uh you talk about will watson charles mason Megan Lewis. I could go on and on and on. Uh, and we don't compete with one another. Yeah. You know, a, a win for one of them is, is, is a win for me or is one of my, if I'm, if I'm hot, then, you know, we celebrate my hotness. <laughs> yeah. We come, we come together to celebrate one another. It's a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm slightly older yeah. than most of that, you know, you know, the younger crowd, but in Anywhere from between 25 to 40, there is a group of young people that's really moving the needle nationally and internationally. Yeah. Um, Monica Kegel, 
that that came out of Micah not too long ago. She's yeah. burning it up, has some work in, in the Venice Biennale. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, you know, again, I could, I could miss artists. I can, you know, yeah. Black Genius Art Show. You know, he he's killing it. You know, I, and I, I'm just really glad that they allow an old guy like me to hang around sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was funny at a point where you were going through the different people. I'm like, you're just naming the people I've had on the podcast, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's but yeah, right. That's right. But it, it's it's shown, and that's really what what this is about. This this whole podcast is about. It's like, look, yeah, look, I need to hear from us. I need to know who mm-hmm. we are. And I, from my vantage point, like I agree with you that you know we definitely celebrate each other's wins. And I think the other thing that's that's baked in there is if we know you ain't about it, and we know that you're kind of faking it a little bit. You're not really about this notion of community because Baltimore's not that big. When we see like, oh yeah, you need to be the top person, and everyone else is under you. Nah, it's it's a, it's a short trip back down. Mm-hmm. Let's just let's just be mm-hmm. you know, clear That's about. Right. So, mm-hmm. I got a couple more questions, and um, we'll be we'll be wrapping in a moment. Um, so I read that you come from an autistic family. Where, when did you find your vocation or your calling? I've been really interested in when people get to that point where, like, this is my vocation. This is the thing that I feel like I love and I'm gravitating towards. When did you find it, and what was that um, familiar response? I've told this story as well. The first time my art teacher held up my work, to the class and say, hey, here's what I'm looking for. I remember that feeling, mm. you know. Uh, it was a year or two after the first time I painted something or I drew something with crayons and recognized it was a failed attempt at what I was trying to do. And and, and I cried for an entire day. So, you know, those two experiences um, really at least informed me that I have feelings toward this thing called creating or drawing, yeah. coloring, like, you know, good or bad, you know, there's, there's something there. Um, but, you know, I have to say growing up in a household where I had an uncle who was a musician yeah. and he shared the bedroom with myself and my two brothers, again, uh, very colorful um, upbringing. So the music was always around. We had percussive in- instruments. We had cowbells, claves, bongos, yeah. you know, tamb- tambourines. Like, or like those were toys that we played with. They weren't toys. But that when when those are things you can listen to and touch at a very early age, um, you look at artwork on the wall. Uh, my uncle always has some of his bandmates come spend the night. And, you know, someone might be playing a, a, a birimba or a harmonica. Like, it's, it's, you know, it was just really wild. Going to Drew Hill Park on Sunday at, uh, afternoons as, as a child and listening to park drumming from a very early age. Mm-hmm. Uh, some folks don't know I studied traditional West African uh, percussion for 20 years, uh, from age 26 up to about 46. And I traveled, you know, um, I traveled all throughout this country playing with different um, African drum and dance companies. You know, that's how I met my wife. I met my wife in Richmond, Virginia, playing drums while she was dancing. So, you know, that also had an impact relative to one of your other, your earlier questions. That had an impact on color as well. Mm. You know, um, so, I mean, I hope I answered the question. No, you did. Thank you. you Thank you. Yeah, okay. So, you know, I got to leave it on this one. This is the uh, this is kind of like the last real question. And I got a couple rapid fire ones for you. That's cool. So, so this one is um, because we got to talk about what's current. Right. Uh, so tell Absolutely. me about the continuous line. And um, what about your work continues to fascinate you or continues to like, yeah, I got something to say here. For the past 10, maybe 15 years now, I've been trying to become more abstract. Mm-hmm. That's a coded way of saying more free, loose less concerned about what people think yeah. you know what i mean yeah. and more concerned about just you know creating something meaningful you know whatever that looks like uh so my current work is an extension of my past work remember i told you first thing first artwork i saw was of african people yeah. so i i having studied traditional west african culture and music art 
uh, having lived past 50 years of age, uh, having traveled to and fro uh, the continent, Caribbean, South America, uh, and studied and observed, assessed uh, how people can be defined as Black or, or of the diaspora, how they live, how they cook, walk, speak, love, honor their ancestors. You know, uh, I've come to the conclusion that the belief, and I call it a belief, that our ancestors were stripped. And by ancestors, I mean those brought here as prisoners of war mm-hmm. um, during what can be, um, what can be, and let me turn this light on, I'm going to keep talking. Yeah. Uh, during what can be uh, defined as the great Mayafa, um, transatlantic slave trade, Mm-hmm. Uh, that they were stripped of all things that made them African. So I asked the question to my students and to others, at what point did those enslaved Africans, because slaves do not come from Africa, people, human beings come from Africa. Yes. At what point did they cease becoming African? And if you have an answer to that, and you could you could come up with, there, there are history scholars that could, create an argument, you know, create a compelling argument as to when they cease being African. I would debate that. But I would argue if they cease being African, they cease being human. Yeah. And I and I to there's too much evidence to suggest that our ancestors never surrendered their humanity. You know, they never surrendered their humanity. So they never really the, the bulk of them never really became slaves. They were just enslaved. Uh, so my work is a testament to, to them maintaining their humanity during the attempts to, to the dehum- to be dehumanized and, and highlighting those things that connect us, not only to our ancestors, but to their ancestors, um, on the continent and I, and to, to other people throughout the diaspora. They're cultural strains that connect us all, yeah. you know? So I sometimes use some motifs or some sculpture or some, or masks, uh, certain colors where I, the way I use color to highlight uh, the ways in which unbeknownst to many, but culturally we are still African people. And you could argue uh, maybe even more African than some of our continental brothers and sisters. And I, I know that's controversial, but you know, I would love to engage in that debate. And it's, um, it was a great show. Like I was privileged enough to come out and, uh, to like the opening night and we, that's where we met in person. Uh, it's always weird when people are like, Oh, you're Rob Lee. And it's like, eh. no, that's right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was, it was just like, I always do that pass or what have you. And I remember, talking to my girlfriend and she was like, when do I get to go? I was like, it's going to be up until April. We're going back. I was like, I got to go back. I mean, it's like, I can't, mm-hmm. you know, go there once. I got to, you know, it's, you know it's for like this month right now. We got to keep going. That's right. So I had to see it more than once myself. Absolutely. Because I didn't hang this show. This show was hung by Kirk Butts, uh, yeah. Baltimore Office of Promotion in the Arts, you know, the curator. He did an outstanding job. I saw it the same night you saw it. Oh, wow. You know, so I submitted the work, but I hadn't seen it. Wow. You know, so I, I had to go back and see it myself. And that's that's definitely a component that is it's lost sometimes of like how uh, something that is framed as something that's shown in like the order of things mm-hmm. and how it's laid out. So, yeah. Shout out to Kirk. All right. I got rapid fire questions for you. Um, mm-hmm. So I got three of them. Uh, so when you're working, what are you listening to in the studio? Music, podcasts, audio books? What, what's what's in your ears? It depends. More often than not, it's music. And if it's music, more often than not, it's jazz. Every now and then classical, uh, sometimes hip hop, but mostly jazz. But there are times when I'm listening to podcasts and I'm listening to audio books. It depends on what I'm working on. Yeah. What I listen to is informed by what I'm working on. Okay. You know, and what I'm attempting to do. 
Okay. I hope. I, I want to know what the pairing of this podcast is. What kind of work goes along with this podcast? <laughs> Shameless plug for myself, right? Um, yeah. Well, you yeah. know I'm going to blast it. <laughs> I got in. I got into. Um, it, it's funny. Um, my dad's a big jazz guy, and mm-hmm. I just remember going to um, going to work. We were working um, bef- before I started working for the Orioles. My freshman year, at Morgan, I was working as a janitor in Hunt Valley. So my dad is blasting WEAA, and I was just mm-hmm. undipped. I was I was unwashed swine. I didn't know. <laughs> about jazz at the time and i was like man can you put on some rap and he, he was like nah this is what we're listening to this is i gotta set the mood i can't go in and deal with these white people with this he was just <laughs> this literally what he was saying so now um the majority of the records that i have the vinyl that i have um like once i hit my mid-30s it was like i'm buying vinyl and this is what i'm playing so i have like charles mangas records sitting over here i have a few coltrane records sitting over here now that's like layered in what i'm doing now and if i need a reset i'm popping on a jazz album and i feel like i'm able to think more creatively just having that in the background um What's the first thing like I like like traveling? I like to live vicariously through people sometimes, and traveling is a thing. So, what's the first thing that you check out when you travel to a new place to get a temperature of the culture in that place? Some people will go to a restaurant. Some people try to find like what's the arts district here, and that kind of informs them on really what's popping. What's what's that thing for you? Where do you go at to kind of get a temperature on what's the culture in a new place? It's a it's a few things. I like to leave wherever there is a tourist district or tour, tourist area. Get away from it. I like to not be there, right? <laughs> you know, and, and, and my wife will tell you, when we travel, I want to be among the people. Mm-hmm. Because fundamentally, all people need and want the same thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. to be validated as human beings. You know, and validated through some type of connection. You know, so even if you don't speak the same language, you know, um, I, I want to eat some good food. Yeah. Uh, I want to commune with regular or ordinary everyday people, you, you know, and you find that people are really fundamentally the same, yeah. you know, um, the best form of education is traveling. I tell my students, get a passport for Christmas, get a passport for your birthday, get a passport for Valentine's Day, Arbor Day. I don't care when you get one. <laughs> Graduation, ask your parents to help you, assist you getting a passport yeah. so you can go and really learn and, and and funny enough, you learn more about yourself when you engage with people who are different than you are. Yeah. I use it as a reset. If Like the last time I actually traveled, I went to the arts district in um, Rhode Island. We just hung out there for a week. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, it's a lot of food culture here. And I was just like, what I naturally would do here is what I was doing there. But it just kind of made me appreciate it a little bit more once I came back. Like I'm going mm-hmm. to, I went to like, there was a chain of coffee shops. I went to every one of the chain in that week. I was like, I need to explore. <laughs> I was like, look, this is what it is. And, right. um, and just getting the temperature of it, try not to do the corny thing, you know, but trying to do really what's happening here. I want to be able to be around as you were describing the real people, what's really happening here. This is where you get the authentic sense of that city, although in an abbreviated period of time, but you get an authentic sense of what's going on there. And, and- I make sure I don't move as a tourist. I don't move as a foreign. You know what I mean? There's a yeah. way you can move uh, and people immediately pick you up. You know, yes. you know keep, keep your mouth shut. If it's a place where they speak a different language, you don't speak it, just keep your mouth shut. But they learn just enough you need to you know, know to navigate. But yeah, don't move as a tourist. You gotta, you that, especially I'm, coming from the United States, that's not a good thing. I'll say I learned that in New Orleans, this, that the first time I went down, I went down there by myself and some random dude that was working at one of the hotels, he's like, you ain't from here, are you? I was like, how you know? <laughs> he was like, you just said something. You 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 sound like you're from the North. And I was like, he's like, look at your shoes. He started going down a whole checklist. He's like, you might get robbed. I'm just like, you know, he's like, you should go to the bus mm-hmm. with me, man. Just like, don't go back down. It's too dark out here. You might get robbed, bro. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Last question I got for you. Um, And and this is, this is a broad one. Um, when are you at your most free? When are you freest? That's a good question. <laughs> when I'm most free? Yeah. I'm most free when I'm helping someone. When I can be of service. And that could mean teaching in my classroom. That could mean cooking dinner for someone other than myself. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, my wife. Uh, I'm most free when I'm being of service, yeah. really, because I'm not focused on self. 
yeah. at all. There are times when I'm in the studio, most people would have thought, oh, yeah, when I'm painting. I get that. Yeah, I, you know. But no, when I'm being of service. And sometimes when I'm painting is being of service mm -hmm. because I have an audience to think about, you know, um, to consider. But yeah, that's the best way I can answer that. That's all the questions that I have. Um, I want to thank mm -hmm. you for coming on to the podcast. This has been great. This is everything I was hoping it was going to be. And um, I want to invite you to tell the fine folks where to uh, check you out on social media, website, all of that good stuff. Oh, yeah. And again, thank you. Thanks for having me, man. And, and I really appreciate you coming to the exhibit, you know, opening. A lot of people didn't get in. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, they can find me at eshaw underscore art on Instagram. That's Eshaw underscore art. Uh, it's just the best way to find me. And I'm learning that from my students. Thank you know, you. it's about, I don't even carry business cards with me. You know, so. Yeah. Well, there you have it, folks. Um, I want to thank Ernest Shaw Jr. for coming on to the podcast and saying that there is art in and around Baltimore. You just got to look for it.